introduce myself for those of you who think that I'm visiting today for the first time. Um, usually you'll find me in the mother's room. I'm married to Frank and uh, he's there. <laughs> Uh, Frank and I are the lead couple of the site, and um, we lead under Bruce and Myra, who are the, the leaders of the church with an amazing team um, of elders. And yeah, and I just wanted to also honor the mothers, but before I start, I just wanted to also honor the people that preach, <laughs> because it's a hard thing to preach. Um, you know, about five or six weeks ago, I found out that I was going to preach, and I knew what I was preaching on, and... Um, like the first day after I was found out that I was preaching, I went to do my quiet time and couldn't do my quiet time. And everything I was reading, I was like, hey, Lord, is this in the preach? Is this in the preach? Is this in the preach? And I said to Frank, yeah, it sucks to be a preacher because I used to just read the Bible to read the Bible. And I used to enjoy the word. And well, I do still. But, but when you're preaching, it's like you're searching the scriptures the whole time. And I said, it's actually quite difficult um, to separate what you're going to preach on and your own personal time with the Lord. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to honor the preachers because it's a hard thing to do that. <laughs> and uh, I also wanted to honor the preachers for being able to put this thing on their head every single time because <laughs> it's a hard thing to do this too. <laughs> uh, yeah, so just before I start preaching, I also just wanted to share something with the moms. Um, and uh, then I'm just going to pray and then I'll start preaching. Okay. Uh, so my kids, I've got two kids. The one is Benicio. He's almost three years old. And then the other kid is Sia, who I think this is the longest time I've ever been away from her. She is almost six months old. And um, both of them got sick this week. And I remember on, I think I was, I don't know if it was Wednesday night or Thursday night, hey, Frank. But Benicio was sick and he wouldn't let me leave the room. And he was sore and crying and, oh, it was just so hectic. And... Frank sent me this, this picture, and it says, the statue of the son was made from pieces removed from the statue of the father, representing what parents do to build their li the lives of their children. And um, obviously, he sent it to me um, saying, in the context of being a mother, and I really needed to hear it, you know, and I think for moms, often pieces of us um, are removed when we actually give to our kids. And it's quite tough um, sometimes to sacrifice yourself for your children, even though you love your children so much, you know. But there's an amazing love that a mother holds um, in a family unit. And I had, I was reading yesterday, I was just continuing in my Bible, and I read, I came across the crucifixion. And um, at this point, Jesus is about to be crucified. He's actually already carried his cross all the way up to Golgotha. And all the disciples have fled. I think there's one disciple that's still with him standing there. And um, Peter has denied him, the high priest even, who's supposed to be the high priest of the Jews. He said, we have no king but Caesar. And um, the soldiers have literally, like they've stripped all of his clothes off. And uh, so he's really alone, you know. And he's also about to give his life for the whole entire world. And it says in verse 25, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, which I thought was quite interesting, his aunt, um, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And I just thought how amazing that there's his mom when he's about to go to the cross, you know, of all, of all the people that he knew, there's his mom. And isn't that what we as moms do for our kids, you know, especially when they're sick or when they're hurting or when they've gone through a hard time, instead of saying, I just can't do this, it's, I will be there no matter what, you know, I will be there, I will watch you when you're sick or when you're hurting or when you're in pain or when you're happy or when you're celebrating, I'll be there. And Jesus' mom was very similar, you know, he's exactly, the, she was exactly the same. And yeah, mom's love will watch and love through all circumstances. It nurtures and comforts. And, um, and it's amazing because then you see Jesus, um, and he's about to die, and he sees his mom. And it says, when Jesus saw his mother there, the disciple whom he loved, stand, uh, uh, when Jesus saw his mother there, um, he said to the disciple who he loved, this is your mother. And then he says to his mother, this is your son. And so even in the midst of when he's just about to die, 
and he's got so many people's sin that he's about to carry on his shoulders, he makes sure that his mom is okay. Um, and I thought that was quite amazing. And um, I think that some moms also just need to hear that today, that God sees you, he sees um, all the hours behind the scenes, um, he sees all the little things that you do and all the administrational things that don't get seen and that while your kids are still alive, he sees everything and he sees, um, and he cares for you. He cares a lot for you. Yeah, just like he cared for his own mom and made sure she was fine when he left. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to pray and then I'm going to start preaching. And um, I'm going to just put my timer on less time now because now Frank told me I must put the timer before and I've got to put the timer. <laughs> so let me just decrease it a bit. <laughs> okay, so I'll drop it down. All right. Okay, let's pray. Uh, Lord Jesus, I just want to lift up this time to you, God. Holy Spirit, you know that we're talking about you and I just pray that I'll do you justice and I just pray, Lord, that we will um, really just honor you in this time. And I pray, God, just for your peace over this meeting. I thank you for just the time that you've given me to share your word. And I pray for everyone here, Lord. I just pray for all of us that we will know you more, Lord. We'll know you more, Holy Spirit. That we'll know your presence. We'll know you. And I just pray that um, just for all the moms here, I just pray a blessing over them and that... Yeah, just for your wisdom in whatever circumstance they find themselves in. And I pray for all the, the, everyone in this whole auditorium, God. Just pray for a deeper understanding of who you are, God, in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So um, for those who are visiting for the first time, welcome. We are going through a series on the Holy Spirit, and um, this is what has kind of happened so far. I'm going to be preaching on the work of the Holy Spirit, part two, but this is what we've done. So in week one, um, Jonathan spoke about who is the Holy Spirit. Week two was how are we filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, and then Dale and Angela came. And one thing I thought that was so amazing about Dale is he really had an understanding of um, the Trinity. He had an amazing understanding of the friendship that is in the Trinity. And I thought that tied in really well um, with the series. Then um, Bruce spoke about the work of the Holy Spirit, part one, and um, Tyre and Daniel came last week to open up the building, and he also spoke a bit about the Holy Spirit, and some of the things that he spoke about was that the Holy Spirit is not an optional extra for deluxe Christians. Um, he said, the Holy Spirit is not an add-on and not a blessing from God. I mean, he's, he is a, a blessing, but he is not a blessing. He is God, the Holy Spirit, and um, we don't need to activate the Holy Spirit he activates us. He also said we need to honor the Holy Spirit. That's what we do. We honor the Holy Spirit. He activates us and uh, that he is God, the Holy Spirit. All right. Um, and so, yeah, so when we get saved, we are born of God. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Um, the spirit of adoption, that's who the Holy Spirit is. He adopts us into God's family. And um, it says, Jesus replied, I assure you that no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reprodu reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. And that is what God has done in your life. He has given birth to spiritual life. Whereas before you didn't have spiritual life, you only had human life. Your mom bore you. Um, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life in you, that you are born again. Um, don't be surprised when I say that you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So you cannot explain how people are born of the Holy Spirit. You can't explain how people are born of the Holy Spirit. They just are. The Holy Spirit gives you new birth, and you are brought from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. That is what he does. And I thought this was so amazing. You know, I, I like to go through commentaries. Um, and while I was busy prepping, I said to the Lord, okay, Holy Spirit, you say that you are the teacher. So then teach me. Teach me your word. I don't want to go to a commentary. I don't want to have somebody else tell me what it means. I want you to tell me, Lord, what does your word mean? Um, because sometimes I read the Bible and I don't understand what the Bible is saying. <laughs> I don't understand what Jesus is saying. And I, I often ask him, what does that mean, God? And 
it says in the scripture, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. And on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. And I said to God, Sheesh Lord, what does that mean, that you are in me, and I am in you? How is it possible that I, how is it possible for the, both of those things to happen? Either you are in me, or I'm in you. How can we both be in each other, you know? And um, I, I just thought about, you know, when I was pregnant with Sia, when I was pregnant with Sia, she was inside me. But my very character and my very nature was placed in her um, because she was my child, you know. And that's exactly what God does for us. His very nature is put into us. His very, um, who he is, is put into us when we are born of the Spirit. And so today, we are going to be focusing on the scripture over here. So it says, when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So that is part two of the Holy Spirit series. Convict the world of sin, convict the world of righteousness, and convict the world of judgment. Those are the three things that we're going to be doing today. All right. Um, another, another translation says, it will prove the world is wrong. Thank you. <laughs> it will prove that the world is wrong about sin and about righteousness and about judgment. All right, so let's start with the first one. Okay, conviction of sin. When he comes, he will convict the world of sin. And the world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. That is the world's sin. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in Jesus. Um, and the Holy Spirit convicts you of that, convicts you that you must believe in Jesus and that it is a sin to not believe in Jesus. Um, and when you, when you go and look at the word convict there, the word convict there in a legal sense means to convince. Like in a courtroom, you convince somebody that your argument is correct. The Holy Spirit convinces you that you must believe in Jesus. And um, it's a good thing to be convicted by the Holy Spirit of sin. It is a good thing to be convicted of the Holy Spirit uh, of sin. If you are not being convicted when you are sinning, it's a very dangerous place to be um, it, because you have closed your heart to the Lord and your heart is very hard to the Holy Spirit. Um, it's a good thing. If you are not being convicted, you are um, shutting him out and you're shutting his voice out. So if you're feeling a little bit um, weary this morning because you are being convicted of sin, it's not a bad place to be. It's a really good place to be convicted of sin because it means that your heart is soft and that the Lord, Lord is working in your heart. Um, it is an excellent place to be. Um, Tenny, who, I don't know who Tenny is, but I love this quote, says, um, the spirit does not merely accuse men of sin. I don't really like the word accuse there. He really convicts you and um, convinces you of the sin. Um, but he brings them to an inescapable sense of guilt. Inescapable. I can't, can't get away from what he's telling me. Um, so that they realize their shame and helplessness before God. And um, the other day, <laughs> I went into a paint show, store. I went into a very well-known hardware store to buy paint. And I went with my, with my baby, and she was sleeping in the pram. And I really don't like um, to go to stores and stuff with her when she's sleeping, because then she wakes up, and then it's like she starts crying. And then everything I was about to do, I can't do, because she's crying, and I have to find a place to feed her and get everything ready and change her. But anyway, she was sleeping in the pram. And um, that morning, I'd had my quiet time. And I went into the paint store, and there was one lady at the counter. And there was another lady in front of me and another man behind me. And um, while I was there, this lady helped um, the woman in front of me. And she didn't greet me. And I was there for long, because she was taking very long. And she didn't greet me or anything. She just left me. And then after a long time of waiting, then she, she greeted the man behind me and said, can I help you, sir? And I was standing right at the counter. And I got mad. I got mad. And so I just, I just, yeah, I just let rip. I was like, okay. And so I said, do you know how long I've been waiting? And so I really, I really took it out on her, you know. And I said to her, you know, just to say, um, hi, how are you? I'll be with you in a minute, ma'am. You know, that's the right way to do it. And, um, and. And, I could, and she was really taken back, you know, and then she started apologizing and saying, I'm so sorry, um, I, I really didn't mean to, you know, 
put you aside, and I didn't know that you were waiting to be helped, and and I was like, yeah, and there's my baby, and my baby's sleeping in the pram, and when she wakes up, then I have to leave, <laughs> and um, and it was terrible, actually, it was just, I just, oh, and she helped me, and everything was fine, and um, and then the one guy in the paint department arrived, and I was angry with him because he wasn't helping her, and she needed help, and and it was just, uh, yeah, it was just like a terrible day for me. But when I got in the car, after all of that stuff had happened, I was so convicted by the way that I had treated her. And I got angry that I was convicted. And I didn't understand why I was angry. Because I, I don't often get angry with the Lord. In fact, I never, ever get angry with the Lord. When something happens, I just trust that He's good and that it's right and that He's faithful and I trust Him. And I don't get angry. And on my way back, I was angry. And I was saying to the Lord, Jesus, Lord, the one day that I have a quiet time and I'm supposed to experience the fruits of the Spirit and I'm supposed to be patient and I'm supposed to be kind and that stuff is supposed to be in me, now that day I have this outburst at this woman. And she was a soft woman. But I, I don't know what, ha she was just very soft. And when I, when I spoke to her that way, I didn't realize how soft she was until she reacted so quickly to apologize and say she's so sorry. And um, I couldn't understand why I was angry with the Lord. Because it didn't make sense why I'd be angry with him, you know. And um, while I was prepping the preach, um, I realized why I was angry with him. And it was because I couldn't escape from the Holy Spirit's conviction. And it didn't matter what I said. Yeah, but it's a good hardware store, and they need to teach their employees how to greet people. And, it, you know, they should be giving good service. And you're right, you must tell her. You know, you can't, you can't argue with the Holy Spirit because when He convicts you, you cannot escape from His conviction. And um, when I got home, I spoke to Frank, and I said to him, she's Frank, I just feel so terrible about the way that I spoke to this woman. And you know, if, if Jesus was there and he was the one asking for paint, he would never, ever treat her like that. And why did I treat her like that if he would never treat her like that? Um, and, yeah, and I just, you know, one thing that, um, you, that I, I've learned is that I mustn't make excuses for my sin. Um, and I mustn't play it down. So, yeah, okay, so you treated her badly, but... Just know she should have said this and this and this and she should have greeted you. And No, it's like if the Lord is convicting you, the Lord is convicting you. And yes, there's other things, but I accept that, Lord. And please help me to change that. And I don't want to be like that, you know. And um, don't, don't make light of other people's sin also. If the Holy Spirit is convicting other people and they come to you to apologize and say sorry, just allow them to be convicted by the Holy Spirit because he's making them change. He's changing their heart. He's molding them into Christ. Um, don't make excuses for their sin either, you know. You can love them and tell them that you forgive them and it's, and it's okay because you forgive them. But don't make light of their sin if the Holy Spirit is convicting them. Um, if they are feeling completely condemned and worthless and uh, helpless um, because it's the enemy that's um, after them and trying to tell them that they are a terrible person, then you can speak life over them and tell them, no, this is true, this is true, this is true. But if it's the Lord, let the Lord do his work. Um, yeah. And so there's one man in the Bible that I really um, love, and his name is Peter. He was the disciple of Christ, um, and it's the disciple that um, Jesus says, I will build my church on you, Peter, the rock. And um, remember what I said, the Holy Spirit convicts you of not believing in Christ. We're going to Luke 5. It says, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. At this point, Andrew had come to Peter and said, I found the Messiah. Okay. He's already come, Andrew was Peter's brother, and Andrew um, recognized that Jesus was the Messiah, and he came to his brother and said, I found the Messiah. Okay. Um, he saw at the water's edge that there were two boats, that's Jesus, um, who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, Simon Peter. He asked him to put out a little from the shore, and then he taught the people from the boat. So he's in the boat, he's teaching all the people. When he had finished speaking, he said to Peter, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. 
Peter answered, Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down these nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Um, these are screenshots that are taken from the series The Chosen, for those of you that want to watch it. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. And Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. And I want to go back to this, what uh, Peter says. He says, oh, Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. I remember um, when I was 19 years old, I was working for the church. I took a gap year. And um, I remember halfway through that year, I thought that my life was changing. And I thought that I was really starting to follow Jesus. And I wasn't bound by sin. And I had power over my sin. And, and then I stumbled during the year. And I remember going into my room and literally falling in on, on my carpet like this. And, so, and I read the scripture and I just thought, Sheesh, Lord, just get away from me because I'm so, so, so sinful. And um, it's amazing how the Lord doesn't leave you there in that, that um, conviction there. <laughs> um, he brings you to repentance um, and then he shows you the way out. And... Yeah, I want to say to you, what, what sin has the Holy Spirit been convicting you of? What sin has the Holy Spirit been convicting you of that you cannot escape from? Um, is it that you need to believe in Jesus if you don't believe in Jesus? Um, is it that you need to forgive someone? Or is it the way that you treated somebody? Um, something that you need to stop doing, maybe. Um, Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate. It's a narrow road that he's called us to walk. Um, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And a lot of people find it. Oh, only a few find it. Only a few find that, that gate. There's a little, there's a, I've had the, um, this is my mother, by the way. She's come to watch me preach. <laughs> and I'm very grateful that she's here and very honored that she came to watch me preach. Um, but she has, a, she has a poster in her kitchen of the, the narrow and the wide gate. And what happens is, in the narrow road, um, it starts off very small, and they just slip through. And then as you go up and up and up, it creates, it, 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 it's almost like a massive oasis comes out. And then in the broad road, it's a massive road, and it's so inviting. And then you go through, and as it goes up and up and up, it gets narrower and narrower and narrower and, until it leads to destruction. Um, and we should always choose the narrow gate. Right. Next one, conviction of righteousness. So in that scripture, it also says, when he comes, he will convict the world of righteousness, about righteousness because I'm going to the Father when you ca where you can see me no longer. Um, remember I said there's another translation that says um, he will convince the world that it's wrong about righteousness. And um, I don't know if you've ever, yeah, the world has a very warped view of righteousness, a very, very warped view of righteousness. And um, it says that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, and he brings truth of what is righteousness. And um, the Holy Spirit doesn't just convict you of sin and leave you feeling hopeless. He leads you to Christ to show you the righteousness of God. And the, it doesn't, you are not righteous, only God is righteous. And I don't know if you've ever been to um, funeral and they say oh he was such a good man and so he's looking down at us and it's it's an it's a it's a very somber thing you know when that happens when they just they're just a good man and they by the world standards they are very righteous um, by God's standards they are not righteous there's only one thing that makes you righteous and that is believing in Christ um, it says nobody is righteous except Jesus that is what the Holy Spirit comes to show you 
because of that, we all need a savior. We are all bad apart from Jesus' blood that washes us white as snow. It says, though my sins were scarlet, he has washed me white as snow. Um, but we still try to become righteous by ourselves. In uh, Galatians 3, it says, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? Let me ask you one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law? Or in other words, did you receive the Holy Spirit by doing good, by doing good things, and then the Holy Spirit came on you? Was it that? No, it wasn't. It says, of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message that you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? And I take that for myself. After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? And um, I, um, one of the things that I struggle with is I struggle with anger. Like with my kids, I get angry. Obviously, because you've heard that quite a few times in this preach that I get angry. But I do. I struggle with anger. And um, over the last couple of weeks, I've noticed myself getting um, increasingly Im more and more impatient with my, with my son. And um, at first, I was just trying to have self-control. Say, okay, Rosie, just calm down. Just calm down. Have self-control. He's just a little boy. He's not even three years old yet. Relax. This is... This is normal behavior. But then a couple of minutes later, it's like, again, and now something else happens. And then I just made the food, and now he doesn't want the food. And why did you make me, you know? And, um, and it was just getting worse and worse. And I, eventually, I said, no, this is not, this, I'm going to pray over this thing. Because this thing is not of God. And um, I started praying, and I said, Lord, please help me with this. Help me not to be overcome by this anger and not get angry all the time. And, um, and as I was praying and praying and praying, I started to notice that just before I got angry, I would realize that I was about to get angry. And I'd realize that actually the spirit of anger was in our midst. And I started to pray against that spirit. And um, I started to say, oh, I just, Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that you are with me. And I cast the spirit of anger out of our midst. And I rebuke your spirit of anger. And I bind you in Jesus' name. And that's what I started doing <laughs> every single time I felt, felt that. And honestly, I can, it's like it's night and day um, with my son. And I don't always get it right. And sometimes I get angry that I didn't get it right. Um, but it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. You cannot fight, um, you cannot fight, um, you, you can't fight in flesh and blood. You must fight by God's spirit and by God's power. And... Um, that's, that's the righteousness of God. It's God's righteousness that allows me to be able to stand on that and fight against those things. And you are able to fight against those things too by God's spirit, um, but, but not by your own might. And I encourage you to use um, the power that God has given you to do that. Oh. Right. All right. Food is ready, says Alan. <laughs> Um, all right, so um, I'm going to start ending then because that's what Frank said. He said, <laughs> when that timer goes off, Rosie, you need to end it, land it in two minutes. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's so funny because I was speaking to Michelle during the weekend. She was saying, yeah, you know, I've been asking for, John, uh, for uh, uh, tips from John because I don't know how to MC. And I was like, yeah, I've been asking for Frank how to, how to preach because I don't know how to preach. So we both asking our husbands how to do the things that um, we are doing because they... <laughs> yeah, so um, there's one guy who um, says that he was counted as righteous because of his faith. It's only, God, it's only by faith in Jesus that we are able to do that, not by our own strength and not by our own might. What are you trying to do in your own strength? Are you trying to treat your kids well, resist temptation? Are you trying to be good to your wife or to your husband? Um, are you trying to be patient in your own strength. It's impossible to be patient in your own strength. Um, to be kind, to not get angry, to have self-control. I'm just trying to be a good person. Um, are you trying to follow Jesus in your own strength? Because that can't happen. Right, and I just wanted to read this, um, and then I've got a, uh, one scripture that I'm going to read for uh, conviction of, righteous, uh, of judgment. This is by Spurgeon in one of his old preachers. It says, even the person who does everything excellently, the one who cannot be blamed for anything, affectionate, tender, kind, and dutiful, whose very life seems to be so pure, 
Everyone thinks that they are an angel. Unless you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And you, the vilest of the vile, you who have wandered furthest from the paths of righteousness and rectitude, you must be born again by a divine life. It's comforting that the very same power that can quicken the moral man, the very same power is able to work in you and change you to turn the sinner into a saint. It doesn't matter how many times you wash a statue, it will not come alive. And that's the thing, is that we cannot wash ourselves on the outside and pretend that we're good and try and make ourselves good and good and good, but it's only Christ's work in us that makes us come alive in Christ and be able to actually um, have power over our sin and have power to walk a Christian life. Um, my, my father, who is amazing, and I love him so much, um, but he used to have this men's group Every Saturday morning, he used to have the men's group, and they used to sing. Outside my window, they used to sing at 6 a.m., and, you know, they sing loud. And there was one guy that used to play the drum, and he was always off time. And all. But they used to sing a song called, The Saints Go Marching In. And um, it goes, when the saints, or when the saints, or when the saints go marching in, I want to be in that number, when the saints go marching in. And... As much as I hated waking up at that early on a Saturday morning, I used to be um, so inspired by all the men that used to sing that song. And they, they weren't saints. They weren't, do, they weren't, I mean, they were, they were saints in Christ. Christ's blood made them saints. But they weren't saints in a worldly view, like they did everything right. And, but they were brothers in Christ. And they used to, they, they were taking the kingdom by storm um, because of what the Holy Spirit had done in their lives. And um, a joy, they had a deep-seated joy in Christ that could not be stolen from them. Nobody was able to take that joy from them. It was nothing, um, nothing comes close to the joy of your salvation. And uh, yeah, so the last one is the conviction of judgment. Um, and this one I really struggled to prep because it's so, um, it's, quite, it's quite a hectic thing, the conviction of judgment. Um, it says that he will convict the world of judgment or he will prove them wrong about what they believe judgment to be. It's not about whether you're a good person or a bad person. Um, because About judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So the devil has already been condemned. And so there is condemnation. Um, and there is judgment coming at the end when Jesus comes. Um, and that's true. And it's a real thing. And judgment is not based on works. It is based, based on faith in Jesus. Um, all right, so I actually don't want to read that. I want to read this. It's from Matthew 25. It's Jesus speaking, and it says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. So He's going to be sitting there on His throne. All the nations are going to be gathered before Him, and He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right, and he will put the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Um, in another part of scripture, Jesus says, I am going to prepare room for you, a special room for you. If there wasn't enough space, I will tell you there's not enough space, but there is space. I've got a special room for you. Um, and then it carries on. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see all of this? I'm paraphrasing. Then he will reply, that's Jesus on his throne. I say to you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And then to the ones on the left, those he has separated, um, he will say, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. They are already been convicted, uh, been condemned, the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you didn't invite me in. I needed clothes, you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't look after me. And they will say, but when did we see this? And he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And then they will go away, 
to their eternal punishment and the righteous to their eternal life. And there is a real there is a real day of judgment. And it's a scary thing. It is scary. Um, it's scary for those who are not saved, um, especially when those are your, 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 your family and people you love, you know. And um, there's, it says, God loved the world. He loved the world. God loves the world. He doesn't send people to judgment because he doesn't love God love the world. He loves the world. He sends his one and only son to die for the world so that they won't go into the eternal damnation, that they will find eternal life. That's why he came, so that he could prevent that thing from happening, so that nobody else except for the devil could go there. He didn't want anyone but the devil there. But it's, it's also a choice that we make. Um, anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged. Because people loved darkness more than they loved light. Um, and so I just want to I just want to close off then. I'm going to close off with one scripture. Um, and this scripture is for those who maybe feel that um, they are not sure where they're going. Um, and they are being convicted of sin and righteousness and judgment. And they are actually scared of where they're going. <laughs> and I want to tell you this is what you do if you're in that place. It says, if you confess, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved and you will not be here. You will be here and you will receive eternal life with God. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. All right, so... Um, I'm just going to pray, and I, I just want to ask if there's anyone here who wants to give their life to Jesus this morning, and you've never given your life to Jesus this morning, and you know that the Holy Spirit has con been convicting you about your sin and of His righteousness, and that there will be judgment. I want to ask that um, you pray this prayer with me, and um, I'm going to ask that you stand up so that you can say, I am leaving behind my life of sin. And... Um, I remember when I first stood up to give my life to Jesus, I was very young and I was still scared. <laughs> and they, I was in kids' church and they said, do you want to give your life to Jesus? And I wanted to give my life to Jesus and I was so scared. Um, and it's not, uh, it, it's, it's, it's the best decision that you can ever make. And you can never understand the joy that you receive until after you have received Christ because there's a deep-seated joy that you receive when you receive salvation. And that joy cannot be taken from you. And the road doesn't get easier, it gets harder because I tell you, I knew that this week when my kids were sick that um, it was because I was preaching. And um, you just push on and you, you just push on and you ask the Lord for strength and the Lord gives you strength. And um, if you are those, if you, if you are here today, You've never given your life to Jesus. Stand up now, please. And I'm going to pray with you. And um, we're going we're gonna to trust that the Lord will change, change your life. If there's anyone there in the audience today, is there anyone who wants to stand up and say, me, I want to give my life to Jesus this morning? Is there anyone? Don't be afraid. Stand up and be counted among the righteous. Anyone there? body this morning okay and if the Lord has been convicting you I've seen the, through the week maybe the way you treated somebody and you just need his power to help you and to um, give you power over this thing so that it doesn't take hold of you anymore I want to ask you to also stand up and say Lord I need this power from you Jesus will you stand with me if that's you I'm going to pray over you Lord Jesus, okay, um, okay. let me pray for the, those of you who are standing. Jesus, I know what it's like, Lord, when I um, just can't overcome the sin. And Lord, I just pray that um, we will just be changed by the conviction of, of you, Holy Spirit, that you, your conviction in our lives. And Lord, we just lay the sin before you, God, this morning. And we just ask that, that you will give us power over the sin 
And Lord, where it is a spirit that is maybe causing us to sin, Lord, I bind that spirit now in Jesus' name. And I cast it out in Jesus' name. And I pray that everyone standing will have an understanding that because we are covered by your blood, that we are able to have the authority to do those things too. And Jesus, I just pray for your power to fall in this place, Lord, and um, fill those who need your power to overcome sin. And, um, and Jesus, I just pray, Lord, that you'll give us a conviction more of you, God, and how righteous you are, Lord, and how holy you are, God. And, um, and for those who, who perhaps did want to stand, I'm going to pray this prayer for those who would like to give their life to Jesus, but you didn't want to stand, or maybe you are watching online. And um, I just encourage you to pray this with me. Lord Jesus, I'm so sorry for my sin, and I'm so sorry for just being so so far away from you, Lord. And Jesus, I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. And I declare that, um, and I declare and ask that you will come into my life, come into my heart. I accept you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. And I ask that you will come and change my life. Um, in Jesus' name, I